Good evening, and God's blessings to you from Zion Lutheran Church. Tonight we'll focus on the blessing of repentance as we look at Mark chapter 14. But first we'll begin with the Passion History 3. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call curses down on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Here ends our passion, history. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. Our sermon text for today comes from Mark chapter 14. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you are talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you are talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. This is God's word, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you remember your first lie? I've been hearing mine echo through the halls of my home with my children. I'm not tired. I used to say the same words fighting off sleep as long as I could until I too fell asleep. Putting the cue aside, do you remember your first big lie? Do you remember 
the feeling as it left your lips? How did you feel afterwards as you tried to uh, avoid eye contact? As the, the guilt felt like a, a physical weight inside you, you, you tried to deflect your thoughts elsewhere. You tell yourself that it isn't that bad, but it is, and you know it. Were you relieved to finally get the truth out, to have that enormous weight lifted off your chest, the, the butterflies leave your stomach to confess and be forgiven and for all of it to be forgotten? During the passion of our Lord, Jesus stood on trial with the chief priests while the disciples are scattered and Peter lurks in the shadows. And we have before us another passion positive. And this moment is one of the most well known in the Gospels. Peter is questioned, is pestered, is accused of being one of the disciples of the man on trial just, just a few steps away from where he stood. There's quite the contrast between Jesus and between Peter. Jesus confesses on our behalf, I am the one they call Jesus, let these men go. And then he willingly goes to the cross saying to his heavenly father, I am the one, punish me on their behalf. Well, Peter, in that moment would give anything to just be left alone. Even after he had been warned by Jesus and vowed to stand with him and die beside him, Peter denies even knowing Jesus. And as he lies for the first time, he, he realizes he needs to be more careful. So he leaves the warmth of the fire to go to the entryway and you can, you can see him there in the darkness his eyes darting back and forth as he suspiciously eyes every person, his mind worried, his, his heart racing, being so close to danger, he, he leaves one shadow for another. But in the coldness of the night, the warmth of the fire is too appealing. And before he knows this, his lips are uttering lies once more, I don't know the man. And this time he can't escape the third set of accusations for very long. Those standing near him proclaim together, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call curses down on himself and he swore to them, I don't know this man, as if he's pointing to Jesus, I don't know this man that you are talking about. We pray, lead us not into temptation, and yet fools and Peter rush in to face temptation recklessly and impulsively. What was he thinking? He, he felt guilty leaving Jesus behind in the garden. He wanted to know what was going to happen to his Savior. But what did he expect would happen as he stood among the people that just arrested Jesus, that just saw him in the garden moments before? We like to feel disgusted with Peter. But we've been there ourselves, haven't we? We stood among the shadows. We thought that we were clever enough to avoid being caught. And there was even a certain thrill, being close to danger. And then that moment came. And you knew you were about to compromise on your beliefs. You, you knew that the lies that you were constructing in your head would get you out of that immediate trouble, but at the same time, you'd have to deny your savior. How did you feel in that moment? Once we've imitated Peter, played the part of the fool, lied like the sinner that we are, what is to be done? We can deny it, we can bottle it up, try to go living on in our lives. Many have tried. King David is a prime example, attempting to cover up one sin with another, with another, and another. The sin's progressively getting worse and more heinous. Recall 
his agony as he kept those sins inside without confession. We get insight to his mind in Psalm 32. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. There are many consequences of guilt. If we try to hide from them, sin makes us do irrational, stupid things. Adam and Eve tried to hide from their God. Cain lied with blood still on his hands. Jonah pouted upon a hill waiting to prove God wrong. There are physical consequences of guilt. You come across edgy, your pulse races. Once we realize our sin, we become angry with ourselves. Peter threw himself on the ground in his grief. He was literally beating himself up over what he had done. And depression is quick to follow. I once read a statistic from a doctor saying that majority of people's ailments come from stress of a guilty conscience. Now, this does not mean if you just confess all of your sins, you'll be immune to a certain virus. But it does mean that carrying the burden of sin and guilt around with you each and every day will negatively affect the every aspect of your life. And guess who sees you as you struggle to bear that guilt and sin? Your children watch your every move. They learn by your body behavior and body language. They see your struggles and internalize them. And then they react to sin and how to deal with it by imitating and mimicking what they've seen. It's a very teachable moment for better or for worse. The far better reaction to sin and guilt is confession. Unloading that burden of guilt, confession is good for the soul. Remember David's relief and joy following his guilt in Psalm 32. I've acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. It took Nathan the prophet of God coming and confronting his sin with the law. But how thankful David was to end this sinful charade for all the lies to finally stop. Another well-known example is the prodigal son. After wasting his inheritance, he leaves for home rehearsing this confession over and over again in his head on the journey. And he finds his father rushing out to him, embracing him, loving him. The blessing of forgiveness changes your life. And as we think back upon our lives, it's so much better to repent right away. How much damage have we done trying to cover up a sin? How many friendships and marriages could be saved? How much pain could be avoided? And in turn, how much good could be done in its place? Our relationships stronger, our children having a better example, our lives having more time because we aren't wasting it, hiding in the shadows and managing our ongoing lies that we've created to further our sin. Did you know that in the front of our hymnal, on page 154, there in the order of service is one of private confession. You can do it anywhere, and you can confess your sins to your pastor, to a loved one, or alone to your God. Why don't we go through that now? On page 154, the minister or the person that you're confessing to says, in the name of our God, to whom all hearts are open, and from whom no secrets are hidden, amen. Then both of you say together, O Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy, and in your faithfulness come to my relief. 
Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way that I should go. For to you I lift my soul. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Then the one confessing the penitent says, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and repentant sinner, confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me, and I'm deeply sorry for them. Then the, the penitent person can confess specific sins to your pastor or to the loved one or to God. And in response, the, the minister or the person you are confessing says, Jesus says to his people, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Then the one confessing says, yes, I believe. Then the minister says, because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. Then together you say, oh Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you answered me. I thank you for the love you have shown me in Jesus Christ, my Savior. Through him you have rescued me from the guilt of my sin and given me the peace of forgiveness. Help me fight against temptation, correct whatever wrongs I can, and serve you and those around me with love and good works. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Then the minister says, go in peace. The Lord be with you. The Psalms are also a great tool for us, given to by God. There are certain ones that we call penitential Psalms. Psalm 6, 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. I'll share this information, the Psalms and the private confession on our Facebook for you to have at home. Confession has two parts. You see your sins for what they are, ugly hindering our relationship between ourselves and our God and others. And so we confess, we turn from our sinfulness, and number two, God grants us forgiveness. The process is as simple as that. Our sinful nature will have a struggle, will have us drag our feet to do this, but the blessing of forgiveness will change your life for the better. You already know how it does. We've seen it firsthand. That we are sinful, condemned creatures destined to die and suffer eternity in hell. And yet by the grace of God, we have been forgiven. We have been given this, this enormous blessing. And it's okay to be emotional about this. It's okay to cry. Peter threw himself all around in grief over what he had done. You know, the word confession also has another meaning. To share your faith, to evangelize, to say out loud what you believe Jesus has done for you. After Jesus' resurrection, he had this amazing moment with Peter. They stood on a beach, and Jesus said to Peter and asked him, do you love me? And the English, unfortunately, doesn't come across and it loses something here. The Greek word he uses is agape, this all-encompassing, forever and always love. And you can tell that Peter is still struggling over what he has done. He answers his Lord, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But instead of using agape, for love. He uses another Greek word for love, phileo, brotherly love. Jesus responds, take care of my sheep. Then Jesus again asks him in the same way, do you love me? And Peter answers in the same way, yes, you know that I do, I love you. Then a third time Jesus says to him, do you love me? And Peter was hurt 
Because Jesus asked him this third time, and he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. But he still uses phileo. He's still concerned about what he has done. Just as Peter sinned three times and denied his Lord, so too Jesus forgave Peter three times, reinstated him, and commanded him to feed his sheep, to go and preach the forgiveness of sins in Christ crucified. You know what it is. You've seen it firsthand. Jesus, too, has forgiven us of all the things that we have done. And he's reinstated his entire church to go and to preach the good news. We have the words from Mark chapter 1. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And we know from Luke chapter 24, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. And the fact that you are part of this church, that you are listening in now is a testament to the fact that repentance and forgiveness is continuing to be preached to this day. We come together and confess our faith with the words of the creeds. We confess that Luther's catechism teaches God's word faithfully as well as the formula of Concord and the small card articles and the unaltered Augsburg Confession and its apology. God gives us the knowledge we need from his word and he helps us understand everything that we need to know and he aids us with the writings of those who came before us that wrote the Lutheran confessions. And yet, despite knowing all of this, you won't want to witness unless you know and confess your sins. And once you have Once you see his amazing grace, the free and full forgiveness, the glorious salvation of our Lord, you will not be able to stop confessing Jesus. And everything you do will reflect your God and your Savior. That your confession of sins leads to your confession of faith of what your Lord has done. What a blessing repentance is. It has changed your life and will continue to. Do you love your God? I pray that you do. I pray that you are proud to be one of Jesus' followers and eager to tell others about him. Whether you remember your first lie or not, remember the guilt that you've carried in the past or perhaps still carry to this day and confess it to your Lord. And hear the grace of God commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ. I forgive you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here ends our message for this evening. We're happy that you were able to to meditate on God's word with us today. We'll continue to do this in the days to come. On Sunday, watch out for our video at 8.30, and we'll continue to, to pray and go to God's word together in these trying times. We ask God to bless us and to walk with us as we go on our earthly journey. May God bless you.